What do Falcons do? We rise up. Welcome to Rise Up Reactions, the show where we talk all things Falcons, NFL, Georgia sports, and in general, the sports news of the day. I'm your host, Dr. Lee Denning, the Golden Hard Doc, and a lifelong sports fan, coming back to you today with my predictions for the 2024 NFC North. This is part of my summer series where I go through and make predictions way, way too early before training camp, before anything on all of the NFL divisions, how I think they're going to shake out, what I think they've improved with. I talk about players that they've lost, players they've gained, uh, the record from last year, what I think the record ceiling, their floor, and then what I actually think they're going to end up doing reasonably is this year. So without further ado, let's jump into this. So the NFC North, as always, you know, they play an AFC division, they play an NFC division, and then they also play one AFC opponent from a different division. They all play the same division or same division the uh, the way they they finished the year prior, and then same thing in the other two NFC divisions. They played their mirror team in those divisions from the year prior. So. For those, this year they are all playing the AFC South, they are all playing the NFC West, and they all play one opponent from the AFC East. Some of these will obviously be easier than others, and some of them are going to be quite difficult. But without further ado, let's jump in with the Minnesota Vikings. Now, this is a team that I think has undergone a ton of change in the last year. They did just sign a massive deal with Justin Jefferson after a ton of trade rumors about him, which is a big win for them. But they finished 7-10 and 10 last year, and some of their big acquisitions include uh, division rival Aaron Jones at running back. Their, Alexander Madison really did not pan out for him, and he has moved on at this time. They've got Sam Darnold at quarterback, so make of that what you will. He really hasn't proven it as the former, I think he was former second overall pick overall. Uh, really has not done well. Uh, they got Jonathan Greenard, who I think is a solid pickup for them. Blake Cashman and Shaq Griffin uh, playing in the secondary. I think those are all solid, but what they're losing, they're losing Kirk Cousins, Alexander Madison, K.J. Osborne, Marcus Davenport, Daniil Hunter, huge, huge loss and big game for the Texans, uh, Dean Lowry, Jordan Hicks, and Austin Schlotman at center. Uh, so all of these are guys that have already found landing spots in the NFL somewhere at this point in time. They also have a ton of tough games on here. They have probably the toughest stretch in this division to open up the season. Uh, you know, they have at the Giants, then they go uh, to, let's see here, they have the 49ers at home, they get the Texans at home, they get they have, they have to go to the Packers. Those are all the first four weeks. Then they get the Jets at home, and if the Jets are healthy, they're going to be a tough team. Uh, they get a bye week early and then have to play the Lions in week seven. So they get a really, really tough opener this year. Um, they have to go to the Rams. They have to go to the Seahawks. They're at the Jaguars at some point this year, which I don't know how the Jaguars are going to be. Um, so, yeah, this is going to be a tough team. We play them. Uh, the Falcons will also play them in early December, which will be potentially a Kirk Cousin revenge game, but they will be playing that game in, uh, I think it's Bank of America. No, it's not Bank of America. Everbank, whatever the heck the stadium is up there in Minnesota. So we'll see what ends up happening to close the year out with Green Bay and then go to the Lions to close the year. I don't think they're going to be a particularly good team. I just really don't see this team having a lot of success. I think reasonably because of how tough their schedule is, um, because they did, I mean, they did trade up to get J.J. McCarthy in the draft. They got Dallas Turner, so they got some guys to replace at the top. But then they didn't pick again until the fourth round. They got Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon at corner. They took Walter Rouse at tackle out of Oklahoma in the sixth round. Really, it doesn't matter for the picks beyond that. Michael Jurgens at center from Wake Forest might see some playing time just because they really have not addressed that position uh, in free agency or with the draft beyond him so far. So unless they're planning on moving somebody on their offensive line to center, he would be an obvious potential, uh, you know, at least backup there. So we'll see what they plan on doing in there but ultimately JJ McCarthy I don't think is going to be strong to start the season I think he's got great weapons with Addison and Jefferson I don't think he's going to be phenomenal this year and I would temper your expectations on uh, on Jefferson as a fancy wide receiver last year he was being taken in the top three he's still a first round receiver I am thinking with J.J. McCarthy, though, he is probably on the back end of round one. In spite of the talent, probably a back end of round one guy until we know what J.J. McCarthy is. And after this year, if J.J. McCarthy ends up being good, perfect. Then they end up doing well. I don't have a problem with it. But I reasonably see them going as a ceiling of 10-7. and seven. 
I think their floor could be as bad as three and fourteen if McCarthy is complete bust. Sam Darnold is not the guy there, so three and fourteen seems like a very reasonable, possibly picking number one overall next year situation. And ultimately, I do still have them picking in the top ten, and I have them uh, finishing out at five and twelve. I don't love that, but when I just look at the schedule, I'm like, God, they're going to open up tough. Like, I don't know how many games they win in their first seven or eight here. Um, Games that I can see them winning, I can see them winning the Giants, I can see them winning the Titans, one of the Bears, maybe the Cardinals. It's just tough to really get down in the mud and find obvious wins for this team because I just don't know what they are. But that's what I've got for the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, I know Tom Grassi will be loving that because they are the purple incarnation of Satan to him. So, yeah, Tom, I have them actually finishing dead last in the division uh, this year. So enjoy your international tour. Oh, also, by the way, the international stadium tour for Tom Grassi is going on right now. So feel free to donate to his link on his page for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. He's trying to raise over $100,000. He raised over $500,000 in his 30 for 30 campaign last year. So definitely a big cause to contribute to, something that I'm going to contribute to again this year. Um, but, yeah, he's in Europe right now. I believe he's in Madrid right now, complete, uh, halfway through his NFL stadium or uh, international stadium tour. So a big thing that he's doing there, he's trying to ultimately raise $185,000, which would put him at a million total donated over the course of his YouTube career. So hopefully he reaches that goal. Moving on, though, let's talk about Tom Grassi's freaking fracking Green Bay Packers finishing 9-8 and eight last year. Now, the story with the Packers last year is, the, is Jordan Love the guy? And early on, it looked like, very likely, middle of the season, absolutely not. And then towards the second half of the season, came on, and it's like, oh my God, they found their third potential Hall of Fame quarterback in a row. He found chemistry with Christian Watson, who finally uh, found a way to stay on the field. He found chemistry with Romeo Dobbs. They had a good run game going with Aaron Jones, which will change, but they, they still get a great running back this year. But I do have a high ceiling and a high floor for this team. And I think Green Bay Packers are definitely a playoff team. They finished 9-8 and eight this past year. They get some notable additions in Josh Jacobs. Uh, they get Keyshawn Nixon. And they get Xavier, McKin- uh, Xavier McKinney, which is the big signing for them. They usually don't spend a ton of money, but they did spend for the New York safety. I think that's going to be huge for them. They were terrible in the secondary last year and I think that's going to help them a lot especially if they can get healthy with guys like Eric Stokes and a couple of the other pieces that they have there um <clears throat> Jair Alexander and a few other guys there they did lose Aaron Jones and David Bottiari. David Bottiari just never could stay healthy he is a very solid tackle when he's on the field but he just cannot stay healthy I feel like he's missed more than half of the games in the last three year stretch here um, just felt like he was never the guy for him. They did lose uh, Yash Nyman, uh, Devontae Campbell, and Darnell Savage as well. They have a couple of tough games to talk about as well on their schedule. They are going to open the year out uh, in Brazil against the Eagles. So I believe this might be the NFL's first foray into Brazil, so I think that's where Tom's going to finish his stadium tour. But they will be going to the Eagles in Brazil. Uh, that's going to be a tough matchup to open the year out because I do have the Eagles finishing pretty well, but it's going to be a solid football game. Uh, in addition, they get guys. They have a fairly easy opening schedule besides the Eagles. They're going to get, they're going to get the Colts at home, which I think they can get. Uh, they go to the Titans. I think that's a win. Uh, they play the Vikings uh, in Green Bay. I think that's a win. Going to the Rams is tough, but the Cardinals, Texans will be tough in here. I'm trying to look through and see who their individual opponents. They do get the Dolphins. Uh, They play them in Lambeau in late November, which should be beneficial to the Packers as they are, uh, Miami's not a cold weather team. Uh, They also get the Saints in Green Bay uh, around Christmas weekend, which I look for the Saints to lose because, again, dome teams don't fare well in cold weather. And I believe there's one more team I'm missing in here as a unique one. I think it is the Eagles, actually. I think that's their unique team from the uh, from the uh, the NFC East. Yeah, it is the Eagles. So, again, this is not the t- easiest stretch, but I do think that the Green Bay Packers are going to be one of the better teams in the NFL this year. I have their ceiling, and this is absolutely if everything went perfect, and I don't see it going perfect. 13, or sorry, not 13, 14 and 3 is their ceiling. If absolutely everything goes perfect, they are firing on all cylinders. They have a new defensive coordinator coming in and he rocks out. They could go 14 and 3, finishing as the first seed in the NFL. 
With that in mind, I think their floor is 9-8. and eight. I don't think they finish any worse than they did last year, and I still think that makes them a playoff team. Reasonably, though, I have them two games better than last year at 11-6. and six. So, Tom Grassi, I do have you at 11-6. and six. I have some potentially bad news if you stay to watch the end of the video, though. We're going to move on, though. We're going to go to the Chicago Bears. Chicago is a very intriguing team. They have moved on from a ton of their offensive pieces, some of their defensive pieces. <clears throat> And they really didn't move off of coach with Eberflus, which I thought they should have. But we'll see what ends up happening. They went 7-10 last year. I think they finished surprisingly better than they thought they would, better than I definitely thought they would. Uh, they are gaining guys like DeAndre Swift, Keenan Allen. Uh, Jalen Johnson should be one of the best corners in the league going to the Chicago Bears. Uh, they're giving Kevin Byard as well, but they are losing Justin Fields in a trade to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Darnell Mooney to the Falcons. Donta Foreman uh, at running back. Dan Feeney, Yannick Ngakwe, and Justin Jones. Uh, so their unique opponents and, uh, end up being the Patriots, the Commies, and the Panthers, which I think are the, potentially the easiest teams to play out of those respective divisions that they're going to be coming from. So... Honestly, I think this could be a fairly easy schedule for Chicago, and I think that with the addition of, um, of obviously, Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze, and we didn't talk about the Green Bay Packers additions. They were a little all over the place with the draft, but going back to Chicago, with Caleb Williams and Roma Dunze at the top end, I think they're going to be solid. They did take uh, a guy that I honestly can't pronounce his last name, a tackle out of Yale, uh, in the third round, Tory Taylor is a punter way probably too early in the fourth round, though if he turns out being good, if he can boot 60 yarders consistently, that end up sticking. Perfect, fine, no it doesn't really matter. But they didn't have a lot to go with in the draft, but they did make the most of what they did have. So Roma Dunze, I think, ends up uh, rounding out this wide receiver room. I don't know if he's going to be the wide receiver two or the wide receiver three because you do have Keenan Allen and you have more there as well. Uh, and Williams is going to really have to take a step forward here. Um, they have not done well at developing quarterback over the last – Oh, God, 15 years? The last 3,000-yard passer they had was Jay Cutler. That feels like it's been forever ago. Um, so, yeah, this is a team with a lot of intrigue behind it. I think their ceiling reasonably, when you talk about the schedule, their ceiling is 11-6. and six. Their floor is probably better than or probably slightly worse than it was last year. Um, I gave them a pretty low floor last year. This year, I'm going to say six and eleven. Let's just assume things don't work out. Let's assume Eberflus has been the problem all along, which I thought he was the problem all along. I do have them finishing nine and eight, and I did go ahead and look at my projections. That is not going to be good enough to be a playoff team, but it will be very scrappy. It will make them very competitive, and if even a couple of things go their way, they certainly could sneak into the back end of the playoffs. They're not winning the division this year. There's two teams that I think are better on paper, better statistically than them, but I do think they could be a sneaky playoff team if all things go their way, or even if a few things go their way. Because, again, I have them finishing 9-8. and 10-7 and seven is going to be enough for one team to sneak into the, uh, sneak into the playoffs from the NFC. And finally, we have the reigning division champions and a team that is on the rise, Dan Campbell's Detroit Lions. I thought they had an amazing draft. They ended up taking Terry on Arnold in the draft. They got uh, Rake Straw out of uh, Missouri at corner, so they took. They went very heavy on corner, knowing that what they were going to be losing. And we'll talk about that a little bit. They went twelve and five last year. Uh, they got some massive re-signs. They really didn't do a lot in free agency with bringing players in, but they got massive, massive, massive re-signs here with um, Jerry Goff getting a two hundred twelve million dollar extension. Uh, Amon Ross St. Brown getting extended for four years. You have uh, Penny Sewell getting a four-year contract. And then they brought in guys like Graham Glasgow and Marcus Davenport from a division rival. Uh, they're losing Josh Reynolds, Jonah Jackson, C.J. Gardner-Johnson, who was hurt part of last year, Cam Sutton, and then Will Harris at safety. So it makes sense why they're bringing in what they're bringing in, what they drafted. They drafted guys to replace C.J. Uh, Gardner-Johnson and Cam Sutton, and hopefully that ends up working out for them because they're going to need both of those picks to end up being phenomenal for them. They didn't pick again until the fourth round, and we'll see what any of those guys do. Uh, they did get a safety out of Utah in the back end of the fourth, and then they also got Wingo, who I like as a defensive tackle out of LSU, um, who I think will be a sneaky roster addition and will work his way into the starting rotation. 
The unique opponents for them are the Bucks. They have to go to the Cowboys, and they get the Bills. So it's tough to be king. You have tougher opponents than the rest of your division. You play all the same guys plus those three additional that are different. And reasonably, I still think this is going to be a very good Detroit Lions team. I don't see them falling off at all. They bring back a lot of coaching staff. They didn't lose guys that we thought Ben Johnson didn't end up going anywhere. So this is a team, though, with the schedule that they have, specifically because of the difficulty of the schedule. I think their ceiling is 13-4, and four, and that's if everything goes perfect. I could potentially make it 14-3, and three, but I feel like that's a stretch for them. And just like I kind of feel like it's a stretch for, stretch for the Packers, but the Packers have a slightly easier schedule on paper here. And then uh, I think their floor is 10-7, and seven, which would be enough to, win, to get the 6th or 7th seed in the playoffs if all things – go pretty poorly or if things just don't go exactly as planned if the defense doesn't step up they're still going to have a high flying offense and reasonably i think how they finished last year is how they finished this year they're going to go 12 and 5 but guys that's what i think let me know what you think down in the comments below thank you for liking sharing subscribing sorry for the absence for a week been dealing with a few things but as always rise up